Well, hello. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. Anybody taking their coats off yet? I've just realised, um, you know, in my uh, attempt to, uh, you know, wear something a bit different, add a pop of colour into my wardrobe, I've probably worn the most least impractical things this morning with this weather outside. Um, but welcome. My name's Louise. If you haven't met me before, I'll be delivering the message today. And welcome to those of you who are joining us on live stream. So good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Effie. Effie, yes, she's pointed. I'm wearing bright red shoes. I was attempting, actually, to add some colour into my winter wardrobe. But I suddenly, I probably need to apologise because I've suddenly realised when I did kind of the sound check that actually they're a bit bright. And with the colour that I'm actually wearing, <laughs> the colour I'm wearing today, I actually think I'm a bit of a walking, talking, licorice or salt. So hopefully they won't be too distracting today. And I will, for those of you on camera, sorry, I will come back to, I tend to, um, listen, I'm from the South, I'm an Essex girl, I talk fast, keep up, all right? This morning. Okay, but as you know with me, there is always a connection because it isn't a coincidence I'm wearing some bright red shoes. In fact, actually, when I say they're shoes, they're not quite shoes. They're not quite a boot, are they? For those of you, they're not quite a shoe. Is it a shoe boot? Yeah, it's a shoe boot. Okay. Now, I think they're pretty fabulous. But, but actually, they don't have any special powers. They're not magical. But can anybody remember, I want to get you thinking, anybody remember some pretty special shoes that had magical powers? Maybe you've read the story as a child, maybe you've watched the movie. Anybody remember? Anybody shout out? Yeah. Wizard of Oz! Yes! There we go. Mine don't sparkle and they don't have special powers. But for those of you I appreciate may not be familiar with the story, I, mean, I think the film's 1939 that film was made, so I think the story's a lot older than that. But let me give you a brief synopsis of the story because it's about a young girl called Dorothy. There she is. And you might see just slightly she has a little dog called Toto. And she is raised upon a farm with her aunt and uncle. She's an orphan in Kansas in America. And you may be familiar in Kansas, they have a number of kind of tornadoes that rip through the land. And right from the beginning of this story, there is a tornado that comes in to the land. And so powerful is this tornado. It literally lifts the house off its foundations and whisks her off, doesn't it? And um, it's so powerful that it knocks her out. And when the house eventually lands, um, it lands and Dorothy wakes up and she steps outside. And she's into another world. She's into the land of Oz and Munchkin land. But unbeknown to Dorothy at the time, her house lands on a wicked witch of the east and it kills her instantly. And the wicked witch of the east has some bright red fabulous shoes and immediately they transfer over to Dorothy and no one can get them off because they have special, special magical powers. And most of the film actually, the theme of the film, you'll see with Dorothy, she suddenly realises, I can't go back the way I came. I've got to get out of here. I've got to go home. And you'll see her desperately trying to find the way home. And she's told, well, you need to go and seek out this wise old wizard. And she sets off along the yellow brick road and she meets some wonderful friends along the way in her adventures. But she's trying to not be taken out by the Wicked Witch of the West, who is the Wicked Witch of the East Sister, who's desperately trying to get her hands on those red slippers. Obviously a very wholesome story that you can read to your children. But there are two quotes from this film, and you may or may not be aware that they came from this film. And the first one is uh, when Dorothy first lands and she steps outside and she realises she's suddenly gone from black and white into colour. It's a little inside joke if you've watched the movie. Um, and she says to her Toto uh, dog, she says, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And then the other quote I want to share with you today is that one right at the end, and not to give you too much away of the story, because uh, if you haven't read it or seen it, um, but the wizard is a bit of a letdown, and she still, at the end of the story, uh, can't find her way home. But then she's told, actually, the power laid within you all along with your magical red shoes, and if you click your heels three times and say, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, then you'll be home. And I want you to hang on to those two quotes because there is a reason why I've shared them with you today. Because my question is, is it possible for us to feel at home as Christians and live in today's world or indeed environment or the actual the culture that we find we're now within that is so opposite, that is so different, so anti-God now, has moved so far away from who God is that clearly actually rejects his ways and how then we choose to live. Because Dorothy's first quote I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. It's actually used in a joking way, but it really is to acknowledge when someone suddenly realises, actually, I'm in a place that I don't know, that I don't recognise, 
and actually I could feel quite uncomfortable and unsafe with. It's where somebody might feel completely, you know, I'm in a world that's completely unfamiliar and an alien. And then culture. We're talking about culture in this Standing Strong series of Daniel. Culture, actually, just to be clear, is kind of like the umbrella term that you would use to describe a way of life, especially when it um, uh, relates to customs and beliefs and ideologies around the social behaviours and norms. It's kind of the habits of individuals within that society, that culture. Or in my world in HR, we kind of sum it up in, it's just the way we do things around here. Yeah? And in Britain, you know, we have a distinctive culture and, and in the UK, and actually your workplaces, you know what, they've spent a lot of money and time and energy to define a workplace culture that will hopefully attract the best talent. And they want and they recognise that actually a rightful culture will engage people and lead to productivity. And you often see, don't you, companies named and shamed in the media for having toxic work cultures and bullying work cultures. And you know, your family has a, a culture, a unique culture, the way you do life in your family. Yeah, many of you may not even be aware of that, but you spend time at Christmas maybe with other people's families and you realise, oh, it's a bit different to how we do life. And indeed, churches have cultures. And renewal here in chapter two, we are building a culture. But you see, what Dorothy is experiencing here as she stepped out into this new world, there's a term for this, is a phrase, and it's actually called cultural displacement. And cultural displacement, if you think about displacement, is actually the moving of something called someone from its place or position. And often you see that with the enforced departure, don't you, of people from their homes. And sadly, that can be due to war or persecution, or even recently, like in Australia, that we've seen from natural disaster. And I appreciate today, some of us, that may resonate because you also have been displaced. And you now may find yourselves living here in the UK, which is a completely different country, and you weren't born here, you weren't raised here. Um, and actually, you've probably said to me, yeah, Louise, there's real differences within your culture within the UK. First of all, it's probably the climate. I, I, I can only apologise. I'm, 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 you know, don't let the blonde hair and the fair skin fool you. I love the sun. But I'm really, you know, the climate is massive difference. The language we use, you know, it, the English language is actually the very complex. Not only is it like the proper English, but we have loads of slang words, don't we, and colloquialisms that we use. Our food and our customs and our values. But we as Brits have a distinct sense of humour as well that we are known for. And that's our culture. But I want to go a step further and say, actually, for us today as Christians, I think nowadays we experience cultural displacement. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So when you get born again, you're told that your old life has gone. Yeah, The old life, the old ways, your values, the systems, what you used to believe in, how you used to live your life. And the new has come. You get a new life, don't you, through Jesus? And with that new thinking and new values and things that you hold dear and beliefs and you're aligned now to something different. But then what happens is you don't suddenly get whisked up, do you, into heaven, into God's kingdom, where absolutely we know that's our rightful spiritual home and we're with Jesus amongst other believers. Guess what happens? You get plonked right back into this world, United Kingdom, a world that actually whose culture doesn't welcome us who behaves really differently, speaks differently, who in fact has moved so far away from God now. And those of you that may be older uh, generations, you, you, you here, you may have seen, uh, yeah, our culture has massively changed over the last 20, 30, 40 years. You, we say, oh, we're a Christian country. But is that really so? I was sharing with some work colleagues very briefly. They were, you know, when they ask you what you're doing for the weekend, and they know, obviously, that I am a Christian. I said, oh, I'm, I'm giving a message, actually, on um, Sunday. Oh, what, what's your talk on, they said. And I said, oh, it's on Daniel. And one of the young women said, who's Daniel? And I said, oh, Daniel in the lion's den? And absolutely. We live in a world that actually does not know God. And not only does not know, if they do, they don't recognize Jesus' authority. You know, in fact, Jesus points out to Pilate, doesn't he, when he's brought before him. And Pilate says to him, you know, just before he's sent off to be, you know, um, flogged and then executed, he says to him, they say that you say you're a king. And true Jesus style, how does he respond? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. And therefore, as us as Christians, yeah, when we become Christians, we recognize that we have a new king who we serve. We're aligned to a new kingdom, a new culture, a new values. And so actually for us, then, earth is merely a temporary residence. Yeah? So no wonder we're going to feel displaced now. We're not aligned anymore. But I want you to know today you're in good company. Because Joseph was displaced when he went to prison. 
Moses, in fact, was displaced when he was taken as that wee Jewish baby and raised in Pharaoh's palace. Ruth actually chose to displace herself because when she chose, I'm going to follow my mother-in-law, Naomi. I'm going to go from Moab back to Bethlehem. What did she say? She said, your people will become my people and your God will become my God. And Esther, she was a Jew and she was experienced in displacement when God raised her up to be the queen of Persia. And God himself chose displacement. Because when he came to earth as a baby, he decided he would live amongst us as Jesus. But the example I want to use today is that of Daniel. We're um, continuing with our Standing Strong series. Because Daniel, in fact, was taken from his homeland of Judah uh, through war because it was invaded by King Nebuchadnezzar and his army. And he and his friends were carried off back to Babylon. And they find themselves captive in a completely foreign land within a very different culture. And immediately they're forced into service and a way of life that's so alien from their own. And I want to pick up right from the outset of Daniel. So if you've got a Bible, please open it to Daniel 1. I'm literally going to read sort of the outset of the verses. It should be coming up on the screen here. This is Daniel 1 from verse 1. It says this. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Joachim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these he carried off into the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. And then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome and showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to um, understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they would be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. I'm going to pause just for a moment there because I appreciate there's a lot going on there. So immediately, Daniel, his friends, are displaced And they're plunged into a a new society within a new culture. And they're immediately presented with a situation. But more than that, there seems to be something else going on here. There seems to be kind of like a system that they've entered into. A kind of recipe or formula for success. That the Babylon said, listen, if we only choose the best, the elite, the cream of the crop, the best in stock, you know, not just in looks, but in physical strength and ability, intelligence, you know, the best and the brightest, But then actually, if we then give them the best, give them access to the best education, special training, we ensure they have all the right knowledge, they read all the right books, and and they eat all the right food, then guess what? That's going to guarantee success. They will be good enough for the king's service. They'll get that top job. They'll get ahead. They won't just survive in life. They'll really thrive, and they get to live the best life. You see, Babylon was only interested in taking something and people that would further their own interests and strengthen their society. What you see here is very much an exclusive, not an inclusive system. In fact, it's an elitist system, you know, with special people. And I don't know if that's resonating with anybody today, what we find that we're living in. These special people, you know, only uh, the few that are selected, VIPs, those that get access to first class, the very best premier clubs, employers saying, listen, we only want to take the best and the brightest from the top universities. And in fact, actually, we've seen recently one of the opposing political parties, what were their tagline? We are for the many, not just the few. You know, Daniel would find himself in a society that was completely diverse, where people believed all different kinds of things. They would tolerate each other. They would believe in multiple gods. They absolutely wouldn't believe in the one true living God. And so much so, as you read on, you'll see that the chief official that they were entrusted to, he changed their names to actually align them with the multiple gods. But more than that, these names, it was about making sure they assimilate into the Babylon culture. I actually think it was an attempt to change their religious loyalty, to kind of almost erase their kind of identity, their true, who they really were, make them sure they fit in like everybody else, make them almost indistinguishable. And I don't know about you, but sometimes that's where we're made to feel as Christians, safest place to be, don't stand out. Don't get noticed. In fact, please don't um, oppose the majority because you've got to be wrong because everybody else is thinking this way, so you've got to be wrong. You also see that actually they took something really sacred and valuable to Daniel and his people when they took the articles from the temple. And then what did they do with them? They just simply tossed them into kind of the treasure house of their gods along with everything else that they would have stolen from other invasions. 
These were no more special, these articles, than anything else that they had stolen. You know what, for us it's true today. Many people don't hold the name of Jesus as holy and sacred. In fact, it's used kind of as a curse, isn't it? And they place no value on it. And I know we've just re- sort of just uh, met Daniel at the outset of his story. But as we explore the series, you'll see that actually he got to serve with, or I think it's around 60 odd years within the government when he was raised into a position. But in that time, he saw four changes of kings. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Sirius. Many changes of leadership and rule and many different empires. But guess what? It was Daniel that stayed. It was Daniel, or shall we say, he's God that had the longevity. And for us here in the UK, I think I worked out we're on our third prime minister in just under four years. We're in turbulent times. But we need to know from this, listen, other things will come and go. Even governments, popular trends, culture, things that we have to get passionate about that's important to us. But guess what the Bible tells us? That God remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And actually, in fact, it's his kingdom, which is not of this world, that reigns forever. And you could say, look, a reasonable question to say was, well, what choice did Daniel have? You know, he wasn't here of his choosing. And how was he, you know, going to get on? This is how things were done around here. And actually, if he was going to get on, or more importantly, probably even avoid being killed, because, you know, rebellion probably was, yeah, off with their heads kind of thing, then surely he's going to have to fall in line. He's going to have to conform. He'd actually follow suit and play by the Babylon rules. And for us here today, do we not face a subtle kind of undercurrent, if not even a stark, in-your-face pressure? That listen, we need to follow the rules. We need to play by the world's rules. In fact, we need to flow with this world culture and buy into the system that we find ourselves in if we want to get the best life, get into the best neighborhood, send your kids to the best school, make sure you're wearing the right on-tread clothes, drive the best car, eat the right foods, which I think we're told now we need to all go vegan because now meat is the enemy, not just to our bodies, but to the planet. Um, But I'm sure I remember a while ago, sugar was the enemy and then salt was the enemy. And how many of us have Nutribullets and juices that are collecting dust maybe in our cupboards because all of a sudden we had to do a detox diet and so it goes on. You know, be at the right parties, be seen with the right people. Lead a life of significance where you get to be the star. Oh, actually, you can be spiritual because you know it's fashionable to be spiritual now. But you just can't mention the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus offends people. And you really can't say there's only one way to God. You can love who you want to love, accept everyone and everything. Put your family first. That's what we're told at work. Family comes first above anything or everybody else's or until they want you to meet that deadline. Find a cause. Get passionate about. And then we'll change that in another six months. You know, the reality here from this story, what I've just read to you is Daniel wasn't put into a great culture. And he certainly wasn't in a culture that was going to set him up to thrive as a believer. However, the other side to acknowledge, he actually did find himself in a position of privilege and indeed comfort, a place of influence that actually if he chose to yield into that, if he chose to follow that culture, bind to that system, he actually could do very well in. But I want to now just read on from verse 8 of Daniel because I want to look at his response. Because actually, this gives me great encouragement. We do have a choice as Christians. We do have a choice and there is another way. And if we choose God, let's see what will happen. So let's pick up from verse 8. I appreciate there's going to be a number of um, verses I'm going to kind of just rattle through here. But I just want to show you Daniel's response and then what happened. Okay? So it says this, so immediately his response to this, it says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for the permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I was afraid of my Lord, the king who has assigned your food and drink. Um, Why would he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would have my head because of you. And Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Haniah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier 
and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Wow. Okay, three very simple things I want to pull out here. Again, a lot going on. And that is loyalty, priorities, and trust. First one is loyalty, and, and, and I love this. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. So no matter what the circumstance, no matter what was going on around him, where he was suddenly found himself in, he kept his allegiance to God. I'm going to align myself with God only. And we may be familiar with that word resolve because we, you know, this time we eat resolu- resolutions. I know many people are making or have made New Year's resolutions. This year I'm going to stop this. This year I'm going to change that. Or for the month of January I'm going to go without and... Not to discourage anybody, but apparently this is the week that most New Year's resolutions get broken. But they're often short term, aren't they? And I just wonder, because is it a decision in the mind that it's like sheer willpower and determination and, oh, I really would like to do this. But you know what? For us as Christians, everything for us starts with the heart. Because when you first give your life to the Lord, it says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And it's a decision of the heart. And I think that's... Decisions of the heart bring commitment. And commitments are the ones that's unwavering. It's long term. They're steadfast. And Daniel, for me, determined in his heart long before this, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to remain faithful to God no matter what. Not I'll follow until it gets a bit tough, until it gets a bit under pressure. You know, Jesus talks to us about the narrow and wide gates, doesn't he, in Matthew's Gospel. And he gives us this picture. Look, the wide gate, many will find it. It's easy to find. It's easy to do. And the majority will go that way. But sadly, that leads to destruction. But only a few will find this narrow gate, and that leads to life. And I appreciate as Christians, particularly nowadays in our culture, our choices will look foolish. They won't make sense to everybody else. You'll be the odd one out. You know, at 22, I made a decision to follow Jesus. Nobody in my family followed God. I was the only one. I was from a completely unchurched background. Mm, What do you want to do that for? Oh, you're not joining a cult, are you? You know, people won't get why you want to follow Jesus. But don't, whatever you do, compromise your loyalty to God. Because you know what? When you don't have God, you have to play by the world's rules. You have to follow the trends and the guidance and what the experts are telling you should be doing. You've got to do what everybody else is doing. Because listen, everybody's searching for answers. And it must seem sensible and logical if, well, the majority are going this way. Well, that's got to be the truth. That's got to be right. You know, but Daniel decided, I'm not going to defile myself. I won't pollute myself. I'm not going to take that royal food and wine because actually I know they're going to be sacrificing it to multiple gods and and idols. I'm not actually going to align myself with a king who actually I have no alignment into what he stands for and who he is. And our challenge too today in today's world, actually we need to reject what the world systems and their good ideas have said, what the experts tell us. Do you know what? Even if, this is a challenge, even if it might appear beneficial to us, that we might get on, that actually we might do well out of it. Because we need to seek God's wisdom, not the world's knowledge and their insights. The second one is priorities. What's important to you? What comes first in your life? Or actually, if I can ask it another way, what do you worry about? Because for me, when I look at this, for Daniel, it was God. He chose God's ways above and beyond what was being presented to him. In fact, actually, I think he was more concerned over what would displease God, what would actually concern him, and he didn't want to spoil that. And Daniel's rejection of food and the wine is even more so than just about food and wine. You know, see, for many, it would have been seen as the inferior choice. Well, why would you reject what the king is trying to offer you? But it was more than just about food. This was about showing, I'm showing you an alternative lifestyle. There is another way of doing things. There's a God way of doing things. Do you know what? Which actually yields results. Because we read uh, later on, don't we, that they didn't just find that Daniel was friends. They certainly weren't inferior. They weren't even equal. They were superior. In fact, they said they they were found 10 times better in their wisdom than all the other men. So what are you prioritizing in your heart? Where do you spend most of your time? What do you spend your money on? I know we're only three weeks into a new year, but how many things of God have you said yes to so far this year? Versus actually how many other things are already filling up your diaries, your calendars that you're pledging money to, that you're actually spending your time with? Have you even got the balance right? You know, I'm delighted that we've got our first woman-to-woman labs next Saturday morning. And as we were planning, somebody made a comment and said to me, well, we need to get the comms out soon because people are starting to make plans. And if I can be really honest with you, 
I'm not here to compete with your diaries. I'm not going to try and see if I can get in first, because then if you're free, you might come. Uh, delighted to say that's not been the case. I think three of the sessions literally went within 24 hours. We've had to put extra ones on. They are now fully booked. I think we've literally got a handful of places with a couple of the sessions left. But we're trying to give people enough notice and time to get on. We've got a women's weekend away in September. Go and read about it in Church Life. You will have got the email. You know, three quarters of the places have gone. And I haven't even told you who I've booked to come and speak yet. By the way, your deposit is non-refundable, right? Okay. But you see, the reality is the enemy wants to keep you from what's most important. And that's actually finding God in the first place. So if you are sitting here and you've just been to Alpha, well done. Because there's so many other things that you could be choosing. And I've done that. And it's not a better life. But actually at 22, I'm glad I chose Jesus. Even if it meant that my family didn't quite understand. And friends, etc. didn't really, really get what I was doing. But I'm so glad that I did. But also as us as Christians, the enemy wants to prevent you having a relationship with God. And really growing in God. Because you know what? The tactic of the enemy... It's not only about leading people away or not finding God in the first place. There's a subtle tactic of the enemy that if as Christians he can keep us busy and distracted and actually subject to all the other world's influences and even get on board with these good causes. Now, I'm not saying the, the planet and the environment, that's, you know, it's absolutely right. In fact, it's a God thing because God told Adam and Eve, didn't he? You have to have dominion and rule over the earth and actually take care of the garden. But there is, don't get swept away with earthly, worldly causes. Because there's one thing about saving the planet. I think as Christians, we should be getting more impassioned about saving souls. Because you know what? The enemy will keep you right where he wants you. If he distracts you, if he keeps you busy. If you're letting other things take the place of Jesus. Because you're no threat to him. You're ineffective for his kingdom. But more importantly, you don't get to live the best life. And as Christians... Can I implore you, please stop looking just to be entertained, to go away feeling warm and fuzzy and, oh, was that a great experience? Did I like what Louise was wearing? Did I actually like what she was saying? You know, the world can do that. In fact, the world spends billions of pounds trying to entertain us. And they probably do a better job of it at times. But as mature Christians now, can we go away feeling going, am I being fed? Am I being challenged? Am I being built up? In essence, am I getting discipled? And then looking to see if we can help other people do that. Because you know what? That's what's going to equip you and sustain you and get you to feel really at home living in this culture and this world that we do. What is important to God and what takes place first to God is you. And that should be important. Your salvation and your relationship. And then the final one is trust. And I kind of, it shouldn't really be at the end because for me, it should underpin everything of who we are as Christians. Because Daniel allowed his life to be led by God because he trusted him first. He trusted him with the outcome. Uh, do you know what? When he actually said, I I'm going to refuse the food and wine. I'm not going to take that. Do you know what? He didn't know what the outcome would be, did he? He actually didn't know at that time. But I believe he said, like, you are my God. I will honor you and I will trust you. And I, uh, I believe that you will take care of me. But also... I think he realized that, you know, he knew God was sovereign. And when God is sovereign, what that means is ultimately he is control above everything and everyone. He goes far beyond the turmoil and the chaos and the disruption that you see, even the unfavorable circumstances that you might find yourself in. In, in fact, even he goes beyond the time now that we are living in. Because you know what the uncomfortable truth from this story, and you'll read it in verse 2, is God actually allowed this to happen to Daniel and his friends. Because it said he delivered the king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. You know, that's just mind-blowing. What, what, what? Does he not care? Does he not love Daniel? Is he trying to test him? No, because the Bible tells me that God is a good God and he wants good things for our lives. So we have to, as mature Christians, go, ah, there must be more to this than meets the eye. There's got to be a greater purpose, a bigger plan. And I'm sorry, I haven't got enough time to go into that. But if you stick with this series over the next coming weeks, you will see as the story unfolds, there was definitely purpose in what God was doing here. But right from the outset, Daniel decided, I'm not going to hide my faith. I'm going to entrust my life to God. And you know what? Even now, God was glorified. Look at the results. And they were protected and honoured and elevated, you'll see later on in the story, into positions. And I believe that God needs Daniels of this generation to do exactly the same thing. You need to choose God. You need to choose the one true living God first. And then you need to know God. Read your Bible. Get to know who God is because then you'll understand how he works. And then you'll get to know who is this God that I am serving. 
Stand strong. If you know God and you know what he's like, then you can stand strong against anything else that comes your way and you know to take action. The Bible says, isn't it, commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. And so as I close, I go back to that original question. Is it possible then to feel at home and live as a Christian in today's world, within the culture, society that we live in, that really rejects us? Is it, you know, can we actually be at home? Well, I believe the answer to that question actually is down to us and how we choose to respond. You know, are we going to be a Dorothy or are we going to be a Daniel? Because if you remember Dorothy throughout her whole story, there's this desperation. I need to get home. I can't be here. I don't feel safe. It's almost like I'm a Christian, isn't it? Get me out of here. And she's got to escape. Whereas Daniel, what does Daniel do? Daniel chooses to engage. He had to live within that society and culture. He had no choice. And I believe, actually, that's us. You know, we shouldn't be enraged. Oh, it's getting so bad. It's not going to change. In fact, it may even get worse, will get worse. But Daniel chose to engage. And there is such a need for God's people to live and be amongst those that don't know God. And actually, we've got something really special now because Jesus has left us with his Holy Spirit. And Jesus lives within us. And actually, what we carry now is so precious that actually it says that we are the light of the world. And so like Daniel, if we actually say, look, I'm not going to hide my faith. I'm not going to be embarrassed about it. Do you know what? We get to then bring God's kingdom and with that, his values and his culture, actually his way of life and doing things to a world, a broken world, a lost world, a searching world that we are living amongst. Actually, we get to show them, you know what? There is another way. You do have a choice. You know, people talk about, oh, religion, you just brainwash people. But what do you think the world's doing with people? They're telling you how you think. They're telling you what you should wear and how you should be and what you should spend your money on. But in the process, I believe for us that we actually get to live this best life. We can truly feel at home like Daniel did, no matter what's going on around, how bad the culture in the world that we're living in. And we get to actually to thrive. I love that song we sung earlier. It says, you know, I was breathing, but I was not alive. I just want to be alive in Christ. And don't, don't you too? Yeah. Shall we pray? Just join me on, on, on live stream. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that nothing is to surprise you. In fact, nothing is new to you. And when we might feel that we're living now in a world and a culture and society that is so far removed from you, Lord, isn't it great that we can turn to your word and there are characters in the Bible, stories and actually scenarios where that shows us that oh gosh, you've faced that before. And so Lord, as we continue with this story of Daniel, may we really take inspiration from his courageousness his decision to totally be faithful to you regardless of what was going around. And I I just pray Lord that we would learn to trust you in a world that trusts so many other different things, that, Lord, may we have that unresolved, unwavering trust in you. And so, Father God, I just ask for everyone that's now going out on a Monday morning, wherever they're going into their schools or colleges or workplace, may they know that you are with them. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.